Our theme for 2024 has been Possessing the Land, and we are currently in a study of the book of Joshua, which I call Lessons in Courage. Now, last week we had the conquest of Jericho. Yay! All the shouters are here, yeah. It was a lesson in obedience. Do you remember the points? Obey specifically, obey consistently, and obey thoroughly. But what if you're not obedient? (laughs) How does that go? Some of us are like, obedience? What's that? I was never that person, right? (laughs) Was never the one to do what you're told. Well, we're about to find out how disobedience goes because the next town on the conquest itinerary is AI. No, I'm not talking about artificial intelligence. I'm talking about a town called AI. This little town on the crest of the hills, as you're making your way up the valley into the land of Canaan, is about to be underestimated as a force to be reckoned with. Have you ever underestimated a task that turned out to be much bigger obstacle than what you thought it would be? You may know this about me. I used to, be, I used to work in construction. I was a carpenter. had my own construction business for 14 years. And when I was working in carpentry... I bid on a job that was installing wood components in a new school building that was being built. Most of it was just wooden benches that needed to be screwed down onto metal brackets that were already in place. Um, That was no problem, but there was also some trim that needed to be installed in the auditorium. And how hard could that be, right? Well, what I didn't account for was the size of the project. Now, I'm not talking about the scope. I'm not talking about my project list. I'm talking about the size of the project. The building itself was huge. And just walking from my truck to the place where I was working was probably a quarter mile, a half mile. It it was a long ways, and if you forget something, you've got to do it back and forth and back and forth. And Well, I was overconfident when I priced out that job. I didn't know what I didn't know. I had a blind spot, and it literally cost me. <laughs> Disobedience is like that. Sometimes our confidence is misplaced. And we are so sure of ourselves. But you know, the only thing that you can be really sure of is God. Sin is deceptive. It will ambush you. It will just like come out of nowhere and you'll... I don't know how many people I've sat there talking to somebody and they say, I don't know how that happened. I don't know why I do this. I know better. Why did I do this? We need to learn to turn the tables on the enemy. Be wise and anticipate that the attacks of the enemy. If we can learn from our failures, our failures can teach us how to be victorious. So let's take a look at Joshua's, we're chapter 7 and 8 today. Not going to cover every verse. There's some redundancy and you'll see we'll skip some verses. I'm trying to skip the redundant ones. But first, let's talk about misplaced confidence. If you have your outline in your bulletin, you can follow along. There's some fill-in-the-blanks. For those of you watching online, there's a digital bulletin that you can follow along with. Misplaced confidence. So Joshua's conquest of Canaan is a study in military strategy. Jericho, you remember, down in the valley, was the gateway to the hills of what we would recognize today as Judea, Samaria. And the next target is to take the watershed ridge line. That's that red line running north and south. That is essentially the peak, 
ridge of the mountains there to take that ridge line running through the hills. And this is the major trade route through the region. This is where the caravans are moving. And whoever controls the central portion of that trade route can control movement throughout the region. So you see a little bit to the right. Bethel is on that route, but just a little bit to the right there is Ai. It's a small outpost that sits on the crest of the hill, overlooking the ravine, overlooking the path that leads up through the foothills. It's only a little more than about a 10-mile hike from where Israel is camped along the Jordan. However, we're talking about 3,500 to 4,000 feet in elevation difference. So it might only be a 10-mile hike, but it's 10 miles uphill. The town itself is not very impressive, especially after having just defeated Jericho. But the location is the most thing the thing that is most important about this town. But before we get into what happened at Ai, the book of Joshua has a narrator. And it's narrated in such a way that the author, the omniscient author, wants to let us in on a secret from the very beginning. So here's Joshua 7, verse 1. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Okay, so now you know something that Joshua and the Israelites did not know. A guy named Achan, funny name. Because everybody was aching after what he did. He took some stuff that he shouldn't have. And nobody knows this but him. And probably also his immediate family. Oh, and and God. God knows about it too. And he's letting us in on this secret. So Joshua and most of the people think that they have been obedient to God. But at least one person has been disobedient. Everybody's confident. But you know it now, and I know it, and God knows it. There's a blind spot here. It's good to be confident. But be careful where you place your confidence. Here's your next fill in the blank. Don't place confidence in natural ability. Picking up in verse 2. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Avon, east of Bethel, said to them, go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, you don't have to have all the people go up, just let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Don't make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, and they fled Before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Sebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So the advice of the spies was this don't send the whole army. (laughs) It's not much of a city. We just took Jericho, and this is no Jericho. It's a little outpost. It's not even on the trade route. It's about three miles east of Bethel, which is a much bigger city located right on the trade route. You know what I suspect happened? I suspect that Ai sent to Bethel for reinforcements and that the little Israelite strike force suddenly got a much bigger defensive response than what they were anticipating says 36 soldiers died that day. Now that's not normally considered a huge loss. But they were expecting zero. They were being picked off while they were running down through a ravine away from the battle. And the place, interestingly enough, 
is called Shebarim, which means broken places. This is a picture of that ravine. Broken places. How many times have you gone into a situation feeling confident in your own ability only to find that you have broken places where you are more vulnerable than you thought? You know, the Apostle Paul felt that way too. He wrote in Philippians 3.3, 3, For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Jesus Christ has done for us, and we put no confidence in human effort. Our confidence is not in ourselves, Paul writes. It's in what Jesus Christ has done for us and His Holy Spirit's work in us. We are fallible human beings. We disobey more often than we probably want to admit. Each of us has a sinful human nature, and you know that sinful nature wants what it wants when it wants it. Okay, I'm just going to say it. We're selfish, right? And stubbornly so. Or am I the only one? (laughs) Yeah. Some selfish people want to make me think so. (laughs) Don't ever trust the flesh. It will lead you astray. And I'm not talking about other people. I'm talking about myself ourselves. If I trust the flesh, the flesh will lead me astray. We need to know and be aware of what we are each capable of outside of our relationship with Christ. Most of us never realize that until one day we face a personal defeat and we say, what happened? I was such a good guy. Here's the next fill in the blank. Don't place confidence in a narrative. Picking up in verse 6. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, they put dust on their heads... And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? To give us into the hands of the Amorites? To destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can we say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it, will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will that do for your great name? The Lord said to Joshua, Get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They've taken some of the devoted things and they've stolen and lied and have put them among their own belongings. So you see, Joshua and the elders of Israel, well, they took this loss personally and they repented. And at this point, they don't even know what they're repenting for. They just knew something has gone wrong and they're smart enough to realize that, you know what? It wasn't God's fault. It must have been us. This is not the way that things are supposed to go. After all, God had told them that he would drive out the nations before them. We read this in Deuteronomy 9.3. But recognize today that the Lord your God is the one who will cross over ahead of you like a devouring fire to destroy them. He will subdue them so that you will quickly conquer them and drive them out just as the Lord has promised. You know, all of us have a personal narrative. What do I mean by that? I mean we each have an idea of how we believe our life story is supposed to go. And when things don't fit that narrative, or when things happen that don't fit the narrative, 
we start to blame everyone else. We blame other people. We blame God. Sometimes we even blame ourselves. But you know what? We rarely ever question the narrative. Here's an example. Has God ever promised us that we wouldn't have any trouble? Yeah, I don't think so either. In fact, he promised us that there would be trouble. Where do I mean? John 16, 33. He said, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. You will have trouble. There it is. (laughs) But take heart, he said. I have overcome the world. Maybe in your narrative, maybe in your narrative, you're always the good guy. You know, nothing can ever be your fault. You know why people do that? Because the shame of failure is simply too shameful. Can't go there. Can't think about that. Can't think about being the bad guy. Got to be the good guy. I'm always the good guy in my own story, right? You know, even in Israel's story, God told them that they are not necessarily always going to be the good guys. Let me take you to Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4. After the Lord has done this for you, and by the way, this is the verse after the verse that I just read a little bit ago. After the Lord has done this for you, don't say in your hearts, the Lord has given us this land because we are such good people. No, it is because the wickedness of the other nations that he is pushing them out of your way. So God's saying, don't think that because they are so bad that that makes you the good guys. You are actually only the slightly better guys. What should that teach us? Well, we each need to remember you are, I am, who I am because of God's grace. It's not about me. It never was. It's always been about him. So where does our confidence come from? Here's what I'd like to suggest. Your next two fill in the blanks. Confidence comes from commitment and confession. Verse 13. Get up. Consecrate the people and say, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. Now, this is a great place to start when things go really wrong. Simply start by reaffirming your commitment to God. (laughs) Go back to the place where you felt confident. Yes, God, I know I committed my life to you. I need to come back to that place. Lord, I commit my life to you again. And here's the next thing. Invite God to show you any place in your life that is not fully committed to him. God, what do you want to show me? Where's my blind spot? Where's that spot that I just, I I can't conceive, but somehow I've disobeyed you. Notice that in this passage, there are these things that are off limits. They call them devoted things. Now there's a play on words happening here in the Hebrew because remember what the word consecrated means? Consecrated means literally setting ourselves apart for God. And then there's the forbidden things which are also set apart, but these are the things that are set apart for destruction. And this passage invites us to see that contrast and to take sides. 2 Timothy 2.21 picks up this language. It says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, 
He will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. You know, sometimes God allows things in our lives that force us to make this difficult choice. We would all probably rather not have to make these choices sometimes, but God knows that being forced to make a choice is ultimately a move towards freedom. It's a move towards being used for honorable purposes. So back to our story with Joshua. So far, no one is coming forward and Joshua is going to have to force a confession. So this is how that happened. Picking up in verse 16. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near tribe by tribe and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought near the clans of Judah, and the clans of the Zerites was taken. And he brought near the clans of the Zerites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought near his households man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him and tell me now what you've done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel and this is what I did. Now let me explain this. So in the Old Testament, the priests were allowed to use a a lot. Um, It was basically two stones um, I've seen pictures of them tied together by a thread, but it seems that you know they could also be like in a pouch or something like that. And they were used to inquire of God. One stone meant yes, and the other stone meant no. And whichever stone the priest pulled out, well, that was your answer. So all of the tribes of Israel come forward, and one tribe gets a yes. Then all of the clans of that tribe come forward and one clan gets a yes. Then all of the families of that clan come forward and one family, one man, gets a yes. And it's Achan. And now everybody knows what you and I already know because the narrator told us in the beginning. Here's the thing. Achan had all that time to confess. (laughs) All that time that was spent rolling the dice, (laughs) and Achan knew it the whole time. You think he was sitting there hoping that the dice would be wrong? (laughs) Maybe he'll pull out the wrong stone and I'll get away with it. Well, they were wrong. And Achan confessed once all eyes were upon him. You know, our confidence is not in ourselves. Look at what Achan was capable of. Look at what we are capable of. Our confidence is not in ourselves, nor is it in our circumstances. 1 John 3.21 says this, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. If our heart does not condemn us, if we can be completely honest and transparent and nothing's there to condemn us that's confidence our confidence is in the truth or as much as god has revealed it to us if we're committed to christ and we're honest with ourselves then then we have confidence not in ourselves but in him So let's move on. I call this section the ambush of sin. Now, we don't like to think of ourselves as sinners, especially when God calls us saints. I know there's a lot of churches these days where sin is, well, you just don't use that word much anymore. It's so negative. But we don't want to be ignorant of our sinful nature either. And even when we mature in Christ, you know, there's always there in the background that sinful nature just waiting for us to get lazy about our spiritual life, 
just hoping that we'll take the grace of God for granted and give the devil a foothold. You know, sin is described in Genesis like a crouching animal just waiting to pounce. Genesis 4-7 in the Message Bible. If you do well, won't you be accepted, God said to Cain. And if you don't do well, sin is lying in wait for you, ready to pounce. It's out to get you. You've got to master it. Now, Achan is about to describe what happened. Guess what? He got pounced. (laughs) He got pounced. So here's your next fill in the blank. Weigh the consequences. So this is Achan speaking. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar, that's Babylon, by the way, and 200 shekels of silver, about four or five pounds, and a gold bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, that's a little over a pound. Then I coveted them and I took them and see they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers. They ran to the tent. and Behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and all the people of Israel. And they laid them down before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the cloak, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, the sheep, his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why did you bring this trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire, and stoned them with stones, and they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger, and therefore the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. Achor, by the way, means trouble. So Achan saw... In Jericho, among the spoils, some silver, some gold, and some really nice swag. He's probably picturing himself in that Babylonian coat, just making it rain with silver coins, right? Well, that was the fantasy. The reality was he had to hide it in the dirt underneath his tent. And there's another play on words because when Joshua says to Achan, give glory to God, Achan, tell the truth. You know, in Hebrew, that word for glory is chabod. It means weighty. So weighty things have value, like silver, like gold like tightly woven fabric. And Achan could see the value of those things, but he hadn't considered the value, the weightiness of God. Oh, and then there's another ironic twist to this story because Achan dies under a pile of rocks. I guess he felt the weight after all. You know, if Achan appreciates weighty things, he should have weighed the consequences. He should have weighed the value of things against the glory of God. Here's the next fill in the blank. You know, sometimes you are right to run away. That's right, two words, run away. Picking up in Joshua 8, verse 3. So Joshua and all the fighting men arose to go up to Ai, and Joshua chose 3,000 mighty men of valor and sent them out by night. And he commanded them, Behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind it. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you remain ready. And I and all the people who are with me will approach the city And when they come out against us, just as before, we shall flee before them. And they will come out after us until we have drawn them away from the city. For they will say, they're fleeing from us, just as before. So we will flee before them. Then the Lord shall rise up from the ambush. Then you shall rise up from the ambush and seize the city. For the Lord your God will give it into your hand. 
And as soon as you've taken the city, you shall set the city on fire and do so according to the word of the Lord. See, I have commanded you. So here's Joshua's idea. They are going to march up to Ai again. And they are going to get this. They're going to run away. You get it? The difference is, this time he has sent another army around the back. And they're watching the back door, especially the road between Ai and Bethel, to see if the reinforcements are coming. And this time they are in a position to block the back door from receiving reinforcements. But you know... This just kind of stood out to me. Sometimes the best strategy in our battle against sin is to simply run away. You know, don't get all cocky and think that you have to take sin head on to prove something. You know, the devil knows that if he got you once or a thousand times, he's going to keep hitting you in that same vulnerable area. And you know what? you're probably going to fall for it again. Don't play that game. Run away. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says this, You are tempted in the same way that everyone else is tempted. But God can be trusted not to let you be tempted too much, and he will show you, what's his strategy? How to escape from your temptations. Run away. Don't play around with temptation. Get out while you can. Let's continue. Here's the next fill in the blank. Take the battle to the enemy. Take the battle to the enemy. Picking up in verse 13. So they stationed the forces. The main encampment was to the north of the city. It's rear guard to the west of the city. But Joshua spent the night in the valley. And as soon as the king of Ai saw this, he and all his people, the men of the city, they hurried and went out early to the appointed place towards the Arabah, towards the desert, to meet Israel in battle. But he did not know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel pretended to be beaten before them and fled in the direction of the wilderness. So all the people who were in the city were called together to pursue them. And they pursued Joshua... As they pursued Joshua, they were drawn away from the city. Look at this. Not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. And they left the city, both cities, open and pursued Israel. So this time Joshua didn't leave anything to chance. He took the whole army and he camps out in the valley just north of Ai except, of course, for the 30,000 troops he had positioned to the southeast. And then he sends another smaller troop of 5,000 in from the west, you know, just to, in case they're expecting a secondary attack, oh, there it is, you know, we, we see what he's doing there, except they didn't see what he was doing. And the idea is to make the enemy think that they are having the same strategy as before, just with larger numbers. But Joshua did his homework this time. And I would encourage anyone who wants to win a victory over sin to do their homework as well. Be proactive. You know, if you're struggling with something, you don't have to wait until it gets so bad until you reach out for help. Reach out for help now. You know, chances are, remember what Paul said to the Corinthians? You're not the only one who struggles. There are other people that have the same struggle as you do. Why don't you reach out to one of them and ask them, what has helped you? Sometimes just having that accountability and encouragement is the best thing you can do. You know, if you don't know where to reach out for help, ask me. I know a lot of people. (laughs) I might be able to help you find the right person, and that's what I'm here for. Don't just wait around for things to get worse. 
You know, I hear this all the time. People saying, well, it's not that bad yet. I can still manage. (laughs) Yeah, right. Reach out for help. Go on the offensive against sin. You don't always want to be playing defense. Do I have any football fans in the house? If you are always playing defense, guess what? You're losing. (laughs) Here's the next section. Turning the tables. Turning the tables. You know, Israel lost a battle that they should have won. They were overconfident and they underestimated their enemy. They had sin in the camp and they were completely unaware of it. You know, if you look back at this passage, it seems that they didn't even inquire of God until after they lost. But everything that happened in chapter 7 gets turned around in chapter 8. You know, instead of being overconfident, in chapter 8, Joshua is counting on Ai and Bethel to be overconfident. Instead of being blinded by sin, Joshua sets a blind trap for his enemy. Instead of rushing ahead, Joshua takes the time to patiently put the pieces into place. And here's your next fill in the blank. Take decisive action. Take decisive action. Picking up in verse 18 of chapter 8. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Stretch out the javelin that's in your hand towards Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the javelin that was in his hand toward the city. And the men in ambush rose quickly out of their place. And as soon as he had stretched out his hand... They ran and entered the city and captured it, and they hurried to set the city on fire. So when the men of Ai looked back, behold, the smoke of the city went up to heaven, and they had no power to flee this way or that, for the people who fled to the wilderness turned back against the pursuers. So here's Joshua, who is pretending to flee, suddenly turns and lifts up his javelin, lifts up his spear as a signal to be relayed to the other troops that are hidden on the back side of the city to make their move. And you know, just that image of Joshua's spear, what does that remind me of? It reminds me of Moses using his staff to part the water. It reminds me of holding up Moses' arms until he wins the battle. And Joshua's going to have a moment like that too, just a couple of chapters from now. You know, God is doing the work, but this lifting up of the staff, lifting up the spear, it's, it speaks of a symbolic participation. Except in this case, I guess the spear was actually a signal too. But my question is this, what's your move? What's your sign that you are participating with God in his work? Maybe it's just a symbolic gesture, but I like to lift up my hands in worship. 1 Timothy 2.8 says, In every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. You know, obviously, lifting hands means something to God. Maybe it's lifting them in surrender. I know, heard somebody say, I feel like I'm a child reaching to his heavenly father when I lift my hands. Maybe it's a declaration of victory. Yeah! But don't just stand there. Do something. Here's your next fill in the blank. Make things right. Picking up in verse 26. But Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the javelin until he had devoted all the inhabitants of Ai to destruction. Only the livestock, the spoil of the city Israel took as their plunder. According to the word of the Lord, he commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it forever a heap of ruins as it is to this day. He hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening. 
And at sunset, Joshua commanded, and they took his body down from the tree, threw it at the entrance of the gates of the city, and raised over it a great heap of stones, which stands there to this day. So Ai in Hebrew, I've been saying Ai, but it's actually just pronounced I, or I, uh, depending on if you put a vowel there or not. But who knows what it was called before the time of Joshua. You know what Ai or I means? It means the ruins. (laughs) And it was forever after known as the ruins. The king of the city was impaled in a symbolic gesture of defeat. But rather than leave him like that, Joshua took his body and laid it at the entrance of the city and piled a heap of stones over it. Now, why would he do that? Well, it kind of reminds you of another pile or heap of stones that we had in chapter 7, the one piled over Achan and his family. And for Joshua and Israel, it was like this is like a bookend to what they had to do earlier. You know, they couldn't have victory over their enemies until they got victory over their own sin. They couldn't cleanse the land of evil until they got rid of the evil that was in their own camp. They couldn't enter into God's promises and become God's vessels until they dealt with their own disobedience. So... One pile of stones relates to the other. Here's the next fill in the blank. Renew your commitment. Picking up in verse 30. At that time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal. Just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel, as it's written in the book of the law of Moses, they offered... On it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there in the presence of the people of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. And all Israel, sojourners as well as native born with their elders and officers, their judges stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim, half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at first to bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. And there was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. So for this section, you have to fast forward, perhaps days, perhaps weeks, perhaps it was months later. But we see Joshua and the people of Israel conducting a solemn ceremony on that same ridge route some miles north of Bethel and Ai, are these mountains Ebal and Gerizim. And they're doing something that they promised Moses they would do. Let me take you back to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 29. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, you shall set the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. There's actually some chapters in the book of Deuteronomy that they were to recite to one another. Blessings spoken from Mount Gerizim and from the opposite mountain, Mount Ebal. There were curses that were spoken. So these two mountains, they actually sit right in the, right in the center of the promised land. There's a picture of them modern day. They sit right in the center of the promised land looking just like the two tablets of stone on which are written the Ten Commandments. 
And they would forever remind the people, not only of the law of Moses, but of the choice that comes with knowing what God requires. You know, you have obedience on one side, and you have disobedience on the other side. There are blessings associated with obedience, and for disobedience there are curses Or you could also call them consequences. And knowing the difference between good and evil means you always have a choice. The point is that you have a choice. That you actually choose. Because you know, when you have a choice, ignorance is also a choice. Here's some questions for reflection today. First of all, what makes you confident? Is your confidence in your own ability or is it in God's? Are you confident in your own narrative, the way you think things are supposed to go? Or have you thought about it that God has a plan for your life? Are you even confident at all? It's perhaps a question that I should ask. Here's question number two. Do you recognize that you, yeah, you, me, all of us, we have a sin nature? Have you ever wrestled with it? How do you keep it under control? By denying it's there? Or by submitting to a more powerful master? Question number three. Have you made a conscious choice to commit your life to Christ? Can you identify a time and a place where you made that choice. I was talking with a guy this week. He grew up in a Christian home. He was baptized as an infant. I told him, I said, guess what? Your parents made that choice for you. They made a choice for you in trust, in faith, that one day you would make that choice yourself. Now, have you made that choice? Have you made your own choice? Let's stand and worship the Lord as we think about these things.